Six o'clock, we'll call the meeting to order. We do have a quorum present, and Councilman Gilmore will not be in attendance tonight. We've got a conflict. Okay, Mayor. So tonight, Council, we have an update uh, on your capital improvement projects. Gina is going to be uh, introducing this, and then each one of the directors that are responsible for the various projects will be uh, supplying information. So because the agenda is so short, I told the mayor that perhaps we could go a little into uh, past 630 because the capital, the CIP project is fairly lengthy, and we do want to go through the details with you and be able to have enough time to respond to questions. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Gina. The first slide that we see here, this is a slide of all of the capital projects that we currently have going, not just those that we're talking about tonight, but the entire capital improvement program. And the point of this slide is to show you that we really are doing pretty much citywide. There's not one area in particular that we're focusing on, but as you can see, we have some spread out. A lot of those are like the sidewalk improvements or asphalt improvements, kind of the eight different gateway signs we've got there in I-35 interchange, so you can kind of see all of those at a glance that it's um, pretty much citywide. So we'll start first with the street my, um, capital projects, and as we go through these, feel free to interrupt. I, I know David will um, have the answers to any of your questions, and if not, we'll certainly find them and get them back to you. The first project is our Valley Ridge project, which of course uh, everyone knows uh, is, is almost complete. You know, it's been open now for a while. Uh, the, the, the final tab on this project is going to come out closer to uh, $20 million, <coughs> so just a little bit short. Um, in that $20 million, we've got uh, $5 million of county funding. Uh, we have 4.7 million uh, in RTR money, and then of course the rest of the money was uh, city uh, capital funds. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, uh, the construction is substantially complete. The contractors still out there taking care of some cleanup items, so you probably notice maybe some lane closures uh, once in a while as they're cleaning up, especially in the median and finishing the landscaping. Um, they should be out of there by the end of the month. Uh, <clears throat> We've got a couple of items on this. Uh, uh, most of you are probably aware that we've got a little bit of an issue with the intersection at Mill Street. And so we're taking a look at that, and then we're going to have to come back and do something with that. Um, and uh, we're working with the engineer that designed uh, the roadway uh, to see if they can help us come up with a way to fix that uh, you know, as inexpensively as possible. Um, David, you might just mention that that intersection truly wasn't part of the project, right. which is what's caused the problem. <clears throat> right. That, that intersection was never included as part of the project. Uh, and of course, with the uh, elevation of the railroad being fixed and then not touching the intersection, that was a fixed elevation. It just created a great problem that nobody anticipated. Um, uh, a couple of other issues uh, with Valley Ridge. Uh, should be coming uh, to your next meeting uh, with the uh, speed limit change. And um, <clears throat> related to Valley Ridge, uh, the, uh, the truck prohibition signs uh, over on College Street uh, should be up before the end of this week. Uh, and then next week we'll start working on the restriping and the uh, signal work that we need to do uh, at the intersection uh, so that we can get all that put back to four lanes. So uh, that's going to be the moment. And all that should be finished up before Christmas. Lots of people are using it. Mm -hmm. uh, corporate Drive, um, <clears throat> the entire project from beginning to end uh, is, is uh, over $43 million. Um, I was just going to uh, touch on the uh, segments that are still active uh, because a couple of them are already finished. Uh, segments two through four is the area over the uh, Trinity River floodplain. Uh, we're treating those uh, three segments as one project. Um, uh, Half and Associates is doing the design. Uh, they're very early in the design stage. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we're working with property owners right now to get access to their property so they can finish doing their soil boards. Um, <clears throat> the road uh, is going to have a 12-foot uh, multi-purpose trail on one side and a 5-foot uh, trail on the other side. Uh, and we'll have uh, some uh, minor uh, decorative enhancements uh, on the bridge uh, going over the Trinity River. Um, 
segment five is the uh, segment of, uh, it's actually Carrollton Parkway because it's in Carrollton, but it is part of our uh, corporate drive corridor. Um, that piece is uh, sitting at about 30% design. Um, and uh, that's a relatively, uh, it's not a very complicated segment uh, compared to some of the others. Uh, so we're thinking we'll be able to move fairly quickly with segment five. Uh, and uh, possibly be under construction as early as uh, 2019. Um, segment six of Corporate Drive, also known as our uh, KCS Railroad uh, underpass project. Uh, as I mentioned at your last meeting, I think we're sitting at about 90% uh, of the design. Actually, the design of the bridge is, is complete. Uh, we're waiting uh, on uh, you know, acceptance of the railroad company uh, of the design before we forward with that. And uh, segments one and segment seven finished. 35 interchange aesthetics. Uh, <coughs> as you know, they've had the ribbon cutting uh, ceremony on uh, I-35, and uh, this project is wrapping up. Uh, as a matter of fact, we met last week uh, with AGL uh, and had a meeting uh, to discuss the closeout of the I-35 project uh, through Louisville. And uh, we delivered a punch list of, of minor issues that need to be corrected on these uh, aesthetic interchanges. Uh, so they're working on those. In fact, I've been almost in constant contact with AGL since we had our meeting last week. or are trying to get it finished up as quickly as possible. Um, <coughs> kind of go over the funding. Uh, there was a total of $8.6 million, uh, but $2 million of that went to pay for the 407 uh, overpass. So that $2 million, although it was lumped together with the aesthetic money, really didn't have anything to do with the aesthetics. So when you look at the aesthetics, you're really looking at uh, $6.6 .6 million. Out of that money, $5 million is from Denton County, and the one6 was a city capital funding. <coughs> David, quick question, just more curiosity. So the punch list, like, for example, what's on there that I would go, okay, I, I see what you're talking about. Well, uh, I know Councilman Gilmore's favorite one is the blue fish lips, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> Other than the blue fish lips. Uh, there's a lot of uh, old minor issues, uh, for instance, uh, I think there were some issues with the, uh, uh, some of the plants were um, dead, that they planted earlier in the year. And that there were some issues with the uh, irrigation. Okay. Uh, and, and, a dead uh, pole, a couple of some dead poles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, there were some dead poles. So uh, these are cosmetic? Yeah, yeah, ma mainly cosmetic. I think they still have to, they still have to provide the uh, banners for the banner poles, things like that. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Midway Road, uh, it goes uh, from Fire Station 6 to uh, Hubbines Boulevard. <coughs> Uh, we've completed the design on that. Uh, it's uh, sitting on the shelf temporarily until we complete uh, our 24-inch water line, which I'm going to talk about later. Um, but the design is complete. We have all the right-of-way, uh, and uh, depending on how quickly the contractor moves with the uh, water line, we could be out there uh, in spring of 18 uh, outside of construction on the road. Northwest Old Town slash Jones. Um, this project uh, was funded uh, quite some time ago, uh, and uh, you know, with the uh, issues we had on Valley Ridge and some of our other escalation problems, uh, we've uh, used a lot of the money that was originally in this project to cover those shortages. Uh, in addition, uh, when we did the uh, uh, Cowan Avenue enclosure uh, of North of the Railroad uh, on Valley Ridge, uh, we made a promise to that neighborhood that we would build Jones Street from Cowan to Mill. So that money came out of uh, the Northwest Old Town project as well. Uh, uh, we've previously uh, cut a couple of streets from this project uh, to try to make it fit into the uh, budget. Uh, part of this budget uh, was uh, uh, what we anticipated would be a $2.4 million uh, RTR funding. And uh, since we uh, originally made that presentation, uh, we found out from the uh, COD that they're only going to give us $1.3 million. Uh, so we're going to have to kind of take a step back on the Northwest Old Town. Uh, we thought the, the 2.4 would have made us almost whole, uh, 
but now going down to 1.3, I think we're going to have to take another look at that in terms of scope. Uh, and, and we started uh, working on uh, uh, schematics for that project, but the uh, consultants kind of been on hold until we can figure out exactly what we're going to be able to afford to build. Uh, Jones and Keeley, uh, this is our flat grant, uh, Federal Land Access uh, Program. Uh, it's a total of uh, $6.25 million. That includes our city match. Uh, the city match is uh, just a little over $1.2 million. Um, originally, this project uh, included uh, not only Jones and Keeley, uh, but it included the uh, access road uh, in, into Lila. Uh, because of the timing conflict with the dam uh, and the uh, raw water line uh, relocation, uh, <coughs> the Federal Highway Administration decided that they needed to drop that piece of project. And we've talked about this before, uh, and so we renegotiated a new scope, uh, and it includes the uh, north end of uh, Keeley and then the very uh, far uh, east end of uh, Jones Street. <coughs> Uh, both of those streets will be 37 foot back to back. Uh, they'll have uh, trails uh, along, you know, parallel to the road. Uh, and uh, we're expecting, actually they've just started the design uh, of that roadway. Uh, the design should be finished in about two years, uh, in 20, uh, around 2020, and uh, probably another two years of construction after that. So it's moving forward. Northeast Old Town, um, we had $565,000 in that. Uh, this is one of those projects that uh, we had to take money from uh, to cover the uh, overages on Valley Ridge. Um, we've got, uh, originally we were going to try to use part of the uh, uh, RPR funding to backfill this, uh, but now that we're not getting as much as we thought we were going to, uh, it looks like we're going to have to scale back and then do, do a uh, mill and overlay on all these streets uh, and then probably some utility replacement. Uh, uh, we'll have to go in there and camera those, uh, and take a look at those uh, utilities and then try to uh, see which ones need to be replaced. Um, and hopefully uh, this type of project with mill and overlay and utility replacement will buy us some time. This is an, also an area that we think that you may very likely see some redevelopment. So spending a lot on replacement of roads is probably <coughs> not wise anyway. And just to be clear, that 565 that's remaining there is utility funding for the water and sewer lines. So that's money we will move over to Northwest Old Town more than likely. But that's we've already moved all the general money out of it. Uh, Mackenzie Hambry, uh, this is another project where we've previously uh, had to uh, drop uh, a number of streets uh, to make it fit within the budget. Um, <clears throat> we've got almost $2.4 million uh, on this project. Uh, we're uh, scaled this back to cover the main streets through the uh, neighborhood. Uh, of course, Mackenzie and Hembury, uh, and then uh, uh, Red Bud and uh, Short Street uh, down on the south end of this mesquite. Um, uh, we're actually in the middle of reviewing the schematics on this project uh, and uh, plan to uh, meet with the uh, consultant uh, before Christmas uh, to go over those schematics. And uh, with any luck, we'll be uh, visiting with the uh, residents in this neighborhood uh, after the first of the year to get their input on the project. Old Town DOD is our main and mill project of just over $5 million. Uh, uh, we're moving uh, right along with this. We've got, we're at 90, a little over 90% design. Uh, we're still uh, focusing on trying to bid this project uh, in January of 2018. Um, and uh, once the project has been bid, uh, we expect an 18 to 24 month time frame for uh, construction. Uh, North Mill Street. Uh, this project originally included uh, not only North Mill Street, but all those streets up at the north end uh, of East Shore, West Shore, Tenney, and I think Point. Uh, those residential streets were dropped, uh, and uh, we're only going to do North Mill Street now to make that fit into the budget. Um, the consultant is at uh, 
closing in on 90 percent design. We expect to have that before the end of the month. Uh, and uh, with the 90 percent design coming, uh, we could be under construction on this as early as spring of 18. This, oh, another thing I should mention is this, this is one we've had quite a bit of neighborhood contact on. We, uh, kind of went back and forth with sidewalks, bike lanes, curbs, no curbs. Uh, what we finally landed on based on all the neighborhood input was a street with no curb, no curb and gutter. It will be concrete, no curb and gutter. Uh, and uh, it will have two lanes, one in each direction, with a uh, five-foot directional bike lane on each side. And that seemed to be a good uh, compromise for the neighborhood. Timberbrook uh, neighborhood. Uh, this project is just a little over $11 million. Um, this is the uh, first uh, project that was funded through the 2015 uh, bond program. Uh, the consultant is uh, getting close to a 60% design. We're hoping to have that before the end of the month. Uh, of course, it'll take some time to go through that and review it. Uh, and uh, once we get that 60% design uh, the way we want it, uh, then we'll be having a uh, resident meeting uh, to go over the project and get input. Uh, Keeley, uh, Mina Purnell. Uh, <coughs> this project originally included uh, the piece of uh, Keeley south of Purnell that had to be scaled back. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, public services are <coughs> now uh, doing some maintenance on uh, uh, Keeley because it is going to be a little while before we can get out there and, and build this. Uh, and it's in pretty bad shape. Uh, we're going to be looking at possibly some traffic calling on this uh, because of uh, there is some residential on here now. And uh, so we'll be looking at doing maybe some curb bump outs and things of that nature to try to, you know, although it's kind of a through street, it's also residential, so it's one of those hybrids. Um, and uh, uh, but for the most part, it'll have parking on both sides and then two lanes of traffic. College Street. Uh, this project uh, goes from Mill to Collin. Uh, originally went all the way to I-35. This is another one we had to scale back. Uh, we just recently had a, a resident meeting uh, here in the council chambers, and uh, some of the feedback we got from the neighborhood uh, is that because the street is uh, residential for the most part, uh, the residents want us to take a look at some traffic calming measures. Uh, again, we'll be looking at curb bump outs. So uh, we we're taking a look at a couple of intersections with possible stop signs. Um, the consulting is looking at a couple of other options too, and they give us some rough price uh, estimates for uh, various options of traffic calming. And uh, so once we kind of figure out what we can afford uh, and how much or what we can do with the, with the money, um, that will move forward uh, with the 60% design. Um, this project is a little ways out. Uh, I would expect another six months or so at least to design, uh, and then, uh, you know, probably a good you know, eight to two year time frame for design. It's going to be a little bit difficult. The street is, the, the right of way is very narrow. Of course, it's almost all residential, and anytime we're working in a residential area, we always, and we have to maintain access to all the homes. Uh, it makes it really difficult and tedious to, to build the street and try to keep access for everybody while the street construction is going. So that's why it's such a long construction time frame. Clifford's Prairie um, goes all the way from uh, uh, this is 121, uh, and it goes down to where the intersection uh, of Corporate Drive will be. Uh, <coughs> Right now, we've got a uh, the, the consultant has given us a schematic on the very south end of the project, basically from uh, the area over the Midway Branch Creek down to Corporate Drive. Um, that area is going to be particularly difficult because uh, because of the floodplain. We have to elevate the road considerably, and that's going to make it very difficult for us to get access into the mobile home uh, community on the east side, and then the Oak Tree Lane community on the other side. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're probably going to have to buy three or four of those lots on Oak Tree Lane uh, to make that project work. Um, uh, once we uh, once we decide how uh, the best way to provide access to these properties, then of course uh, we'll we'll move on uh, to a preliminary design for the whole road. But 
uh, we really need to kind of figure out uh, how we're going to uh, do the south end of the road in terms of access. In fact, we've already commented on that the ownership of the mobile home park and trying to engage them on their preferences for access. That's mine. Uh, Gateway Monument signs. We've got. Uh, we were here in front of you just a couple months ago to award this contract. We've got eight signs currently under construction on a city contract, and then we have the two that are uh, part of the Texas Green Ribbon Project. The only real change uh, from what you saw before was the sign that was at 3040 at our western city limits, Texas Roadway. They rejected <coughs> our, our permit request to build that sign. The speed limit on that stretch of road is 50 miles an hour, and they said you can't have the sign in the median out there. So we moved it to the other side at uh, Hebron and Railroad, where we were going to do a future sign. Um, when we estimated the cost of these signs, we were saying around $50,000 a piece. These came in under 30, so we thought, well, we might as well build that sign while we've got it for a, what's a good price. So. Uh, you'll see we started at uh, uh, Valley Ridge in 35. We've been doing work at uh, MacArthur and, and Denton Tap at the South End, so you'll start seeing those signs come up. Uh, we're reviewing and approving their submittals and, and, and making good progress. Uh, should be complete uh, spring of, of next year. I noticed the sign come up in front of the visitor center, too. Yeah, yeah, that's separate, separate, separate contract. Separate yes, project, we are working on that one. It's coming up, too. Yeah, that'll be a nice sign. I'm just disappointed we're not getting firemen on the bird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very witty. I'm back here. <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, first utility project is our midway branch to the station at Forest Main. Uh, uh, well, probably $11 million project. Uh, this, this project, though, we've ran into a little bit of a snag uh, with regard to a, a conflict with Upper Trinity Water District and uh, the, the, the Corps of Engineers. Um, and we're going to have to rethink the routing of our, uh, or we may have to rethink the routing of our uh, force main uh, once you get north of uh, Business 121. Um, uh, the issue is that, uh, as the Corps of Engineers does, do. They, they provided a utility corridor, uh, which is adjacent to the railroad. Uh, unfortunately, the Upper Trinity Water District has taken up that entire corridor with, you know, with an easement, so there's no more room left in the utility corridor. Um, so what it comes down, we'll have to renegotiate, we'll have to negotiate a brand new utility corridor, and that could take a little while. Um, uh, we've already purchased the lift station site. Uh, and uh, we are going to build a portion of the force main under uh, Holford's Prairie Road where we build Midway Road. Uh, so that would be already be underground and we want to disturb the roads again out there once they're complete. Any other questions? We have our Midway West 24 inch water main. This is the water main I mentioned earlier uh, that uh, we need to get the portion of the Midway Road uh, pretty well completed before we can start the road construction. Uh, this contract was recently approved. As a matter of fact, we have a, a construction meeting on this project tomorrow, uh, and uh, I would expect the contract to be under construction just after the first of the year. So, uh, the water line uh, south of the dam, David mentioned the dam project. They do have a actually a five-year project that's going to uh, take care of some dam modifications and, and actually in this area right here uh, there's a, a, some seepage under the dam that they're going to get in there and make a permanent repair to. Uh, that, that facilitates the need for us to relocate our raw water lines. We've got our, our, our this is our intake structure and then this is our shared intake structure with Upper Trinity. We've got a line that comes out of each one and hits down to the plant uh, on Jones. So we do have a, a, a relocation of those two water lines <coughs> in take place. We've been partnering with the Corps of Engineers on, on their projects, so our plans that are being developed are going to be put into their bid package. Their contractor is actually going to relocate those water lines for us, and, and, and we're going to oversee that piece of the construction. Um, our, our plans, we turned in 35% end of November. The final plans are due in fall of 2018. And the core plans to, to bid and begin that work 
uh, sometime in 2019, uh, probably in the spring, our water line work will be done at the beginning of the project um, so that, that we can get out of the way of their seepage area work. So. We also have a few studies going on over in the uh, Public Services Department. Uh, uh, I and I study inflow and infiltration. We've got some meters in the ground right now, and I believe it's uh, 29 or, or 32, somewhere in there, uh, manholes out, out in our system. We haven't had enough rain lately to get a good um, uh, measure of what the inflow and infiltration is. So right now they're turned off and they're sitting in our manholes waiting for a good rain. We'll turn them back on and, and, uh, and capture that data. The good news is we've got dry weather flows, so we've got a good baseline. Now we need some good wet weather flows to, to uh, finish that study. Ozonation, you've heard me come up here and talk a little bit about ozonation before. We are in the process of studying that. It will be uh, implemented for taste and odor primarily at the beginning. Um, the study right now, we've done some water testing. They're waiting on some final results, but uh, what we expect to get from this study is recommendations on quantity of ozone, size of equipment, contact time for that ozone to be in contact with the water, which will set a uh, basically a basin size for that water to flow through and, and be in contact. So this process is going to get us basically a schematic design and some equipment recommendations. Should we decide to move forward, it would be another uh, PSA, another engineering contract for detailed design. Uh, and that would happen sometime probably in the spring of this next year that we come back with that. Uh, very likely we would present you guys a, 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 a presentation on what we learned that we're going to try to move forward with on that. Master plan update includes uh, land use assumption update, which is now, um, uh, I say complete, we got our final draft. You'll see a, a, a final document come forward after a little while. That's a land use update that Richard and his group uh, led. Um, that feeds into a master plan update of our water and sewer plan, which then feeds into an impact fee update. So that's a, an iterative process. And it's, it's going right now. We've got that final draft of the, of the population numbers that will help us move forward with the end piece. We should be back uh, early next year with the, the impact fee numbers to present to you. There was some discussion at the uh, budget workshop about impact fees, and that is the only methodology to change your impact fee has to be through this study. So and it's required every so often every to, to, to restart five years. every five mm -hmm. years. Yeah. The land use assumptions, if you can say they haven't changed, you can, you can skip uh, an iteration on that. So it actually has been 10 years since we did the land use assumption update, and that's really what caused that to take such a long time to, to, to do. The last one on there that we're working on is an asset inventory. And so what we've got, we've got a consultant in place that's doing an analysis of all of our line segments in the city, both water and wastewater. They're looking at uh, age, pipe material, um, uh, you know, type of construction in some cases, but they're also looking at a consequence of failure, what happens if this line segment <laughs> fails, and then a likelihood of failure. And based on that, they're, they're, they're creating a matrix of all of these line segments will give us a, a better focus of where do we need to, to do replacement, renovation, uh, increase line sizes, that sort of thing. And, and uh, uh, that'll really help us produce one, the, the, the uh, uh, report card, the, the, the uh, uh, inventory that, 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 that Gina runs for us. But it'll also help us focus uh, our energy on where do we need to spend time replacing things. Uh, that's it for me. And we, per, we asked Keith to talk about these studies a little bit because you might wonder where some of the major projects on the utility side like the I-35 water tower or ozonation project are and they're really a lot of those projects are awaiting studies and kind of where our expansions are going to occur are going to be the result of some of these studies. Yeah, so that master plan. Sure you know there's a lot of work going on. It's just not an actual project. That master plan update in particular will help with things like the 35 water tower and some of the other larger projects. Where to go uh, so we'll talk a little bit about parks projects. I think Eric's MTC. So I'm giving an update on the MTC where we are today. We're in design development phase, plan specifications. That's not construction plans. Um, it's, it's, it's really an element that's come out of our CMAR process compared to competitive sealed, sealed bid uh, processes. But design documents basically allows that opportunity for staff and the design development team 
to basically cost out the project now as opposed to a competitive seal where it's way down the road or perhaps six, eight, nine months into the project and whoops, we've got a pretty good sized change order. Keeps everybody happier and keeps everybody on the papers. But design development has gone on for the last several months. These are meetings every month by the design team of BRS, PPV, that's Chris, Chris, Chris Squadras Group. We have uh, uh, city staff ranging from nearly every department, I would say 12 to 15 members on the team. You have, um, you have some citizens that are still in there from the design group, uh, Aaron Locke from 2025, uh, Derek Hyena, uh, Bobby Collier from the Senior Center, so they're still involved in, in going through these meetings. Uh, we're essentially winding down. Uh, staff met last week uh, on one of the regular meetings to go over a two-day agenda, basically to wind down the design development. We'll start construction plans now. We'll go construction plans all the way through, say, March or April of 18. We'll spend about six or eight weeks after that for the bidding process. We'll go to work at the end of June, July, under construction of 18. Finishing the, prog the, pro the project uh, late December of 19, opening sometime early January 2020. Let me talk to you a little bit about what's, what's going on here with the CMAR, pro with CMAR process. Peak Performance Value, that's Chris's company, and his staff has worked well with city staff. He's an independent third eye or fourth eye, tenth eye, looking at the project, real-time cost estimating at this point. And Chris will tell you quite abruptly that there's companies that can do it and there's companies that cannot. That's the difference here. And they're getting, they're drilling down into the elements of, of hardware, door stops, glazing, skylights, type of skylight, steel, jipboard, electrical, low voltage, everything you can think of at this point. And keep in mind we don't have construction plans. So this has a really been, to date, a very effective tool to work with this. A lot of work, a lot of staff hours, but we'd rather do it now than later. So it's really quite neat to see Chris's group deal with staff in the design team, actually have Byrne Construction, who's our CMAR, construction manager at risk, out of the room. So Chris walks us through where we are with our budget at 50% design development versus 100%, which we're now, shows us where we're high, where we're low. And Chris is kind of guy that he'll tell you, he'll tell you that uh, he wants a lot of contingency and a lot of escalation and you can build that back into the project as values go up and down and as elements get costed out. That's what we're doing right now. He'll go over with staff, he'll tell us what Burn's going to do, then Burn enters the room and they bring in a, a large spreadsheet with a lot of detail, a lot of real-time costs. And Chris represents the city, he's really a good third-eye staff talking with Burn, and Burn is doing a great job at paralleling those costs. And where they're different, then those two go out and they figure out how to get the better pricing. Now we're not bidding, but Burn Construction is talking to those subcontractors they're dealing with on other jobs about what's going on in the price right then and right now. But we all know the world's changing because of hurricanes, earthquakes, the stock markets across the country are going wild. Chris can talk for three hours on what he's seeing out there, but things that are going well right now on the value engineering side of the project are acoustical panels. We have a lot of those in this building. We were, our estimate at 50% was much higher. They've come in lower. Uh, skylights, we changed the design. Natural lighting in this MGC is utmost important. Skylights have come down in cost. Glazing, that's your wall panels, windows, glass, everything that's dealt with roofs and things. So with, with, with some sort of glazing, Material up, they're, they're less than what we predicted. Steel's actually come down. What's gone up? Well, that's a no-brainer. Concrete, steel, copper's up 30% this year. Um, a lot of other things have, are going up and down, and as those, as those dollars come in, uh, it's looking right now we have a good base price on the project, and there's a high possibility that as soon as step one or step two and escalation and contingency don't check, check out to be good, we can roll those dollars in, and maybe it looks like we can get the Northeast Plaza if council wishes. We'll bring this back when we get closer, but it looks like Northeast Plaza could be a very viable alternative to come into the project. Um, and I think we're on construction. It's been very well. Chris will tell you the world market right now is flourishing. 
But he will tell you, if you can look online, I saw it, but there's a graph that the Wall Street Journal has that shows an interesting uh, country by country relationship to the, the GDP versus government debt. Most countries, when they go over 100%, their economy crashes. Uh, General Motors, uh, last year, their 40% of their revenue was to China. China right now is at 150%. So Chris is saying the minute that crumbles, that could be an advantage for us for cost prices. So there's a lot going on out there. He's watching the global market. He's watching the local market for us. Burns doing a great job. The project is, is well on key. Staff's doing a great job with their other design team. Uh, that's where we are today. So it seems like it's taken forever to get to the point to where we are now, but I will tell you, I think just a lot of quality work has gone into this process, and it'll be unlike, I wish we had had this process when we built the MCL, because I remember sitting here with, and when we talked about the MCL, having to come back to the council and say, we need two million more dollars. So this whole planning process hopefully will avoid that process, and in the end, we will have a better facility. So the Garden Ridge Trail Project, this is one of uh, pretty exciting, especially with the 35 uh, corridors getting finished up and creating connectivity on the eastern side of the expressway. We'll be uh, creating some shared use, use paths uh, down Garden Ridge to about 407, a little bit uh, further south of that we'll jump on and use the medians to do a a fairly wide trail through the medians coming down to uh, South Valley Parkway then doing a shared use trail or shared um, lane use to come back down to the, the annex. We're working with half associates for the design on this. If you'll remember, this is a, a large grant from TxDOT. They're um, bringing about 80% 80, 80 of the cost of this to the table. Uh, they submitted 95% designs and they'll go back and forth with TxDOT over the next couple of months and look at some environmental scoping uh, that should be completed in May. We're working with that grant uh, uh, funding that's in it. We've got a deadline that we have to open and award bids by August of next year to keep the funding and construction will move into immediately after that. It'll take about 14 to 18 months. The good thing is, is this will connect us out to Highlands uh, Park. It'll connect us up here. We'll be able to uh, uh, really hopefully connect to the DCTA trail, especially as the Tower Bay project goes through. So we're excited about this. Next. Um, and the kayak access points, uh, we have designed to launch our take launch and takeout points along the Trinity River, one at Leela and one at the Heber um, Parkway. It's taken a little longer than originally expected to design, a little bit because of the flooding out there. You have to be able to get out there and survey to know how you're going to design it. They just weren't able to. So we're working with Jacobs right now to uh, modify the original design, which came in uh, uh, greatly over, over budget, but it's given us an opportunity uh, to uh, accommodate the projects that Keith and David talked about in terms of the dam um, uh, construction and the re re uh, relocation of those water lines within Leela, um, and also probably give us an opportunity maybe to go after some Texas Parks and Wildlife boat access grants to get that one in Leela done in the future. Um, so we're excited about that. One of the other things that has kind of delayed this is we have to do a muscle survey along the Trinity River, and there's certain timing that you have to hit with uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife and the uh, Corps of Engineer requirements, and that hap you have to do it in the spring, and you have to start construction uh, before m in, in May for that. So we're working on that timeline and working with the uh, Jacobs to bring that. So we'll. Head out for the Hebron Parkway um, launch first, and then work towards getting that one in Leela done um, afterwards. Council, you remember you first budgeted this in 1450, and then Noah's floods came, and so we lost 15, and then we lost 16, and then in 17 we found out about the mussels. So I know this seems like a really long delay. Uh, and it is, but that is why. And then, of course, we had the escalation in cost, and that's why now we're focused on just that one access. 
Well, in the Nature Center, there's a design charrette that was completed shortly before I arrived and um, kind of settled on some of the elements that need to be in the Nature Center in terms of balancing uh, the research and then hosting events and welcoming the public out there. And we're starting to look at other Nature Center designs throughout the nation. We've got some down in Bernie and Austin, uh, Corpus Christi, and there's a couple in Kansas that we'd like to take a look at, not to copy, but to just get some ideas and in about innovative designs that people have used and then personalize them for ourselves um, in terms of Leela. Right now, we're working on the environmental assessment to determine exactly the location of where the center should go. Uh, you have to do that to uh, overcome some of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineering requirement um, in order uh, to get moving on, on design, which we'll be moving towards in 2018 and hopefully looking at construction documents in 2019 with construction in 2020. Uh, we continue to work with our partners to develop operational plans uh, for moving forward and bringing in the Audubon Society and making sure that we keep the momentum going that we've had over the last several years. And Stacy's been able to work through use agreements, which we're hoping to take to all the boards in January. In our uh, uh, current budget, uh, the 17-18 uh, budget, uh, we had an action step to uh, fund the design of the Timber Creek Erosion. It's uh, the extension of the uh, Agency Drive project we did several years ago. Um, this this uh, extension will take it around the bend uh, adjacent to, uh, I can't remember the name. Kenny Court. Uh, Ken, yeah, Kenny Court. Um, and then uh, take it around that bend uh, where there's uh, been some uh, significant erosion. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, at your next meeting, uh, we intend to bring uh, the PSA uh, for the uh, part, at least partial design. And I say partial design. We originally anticipated the $135,000 uh, paying for the uh, entire design. Uh, but when we finally got our PSA, it was a little bit more than that. Uh, and so we negotiated with half and associates uh, to do a, a 90, what we would call a 90% design. Um, it's going to take us a while to do that anyway. Uh, and then uh, we'll come back uh, in our next uh, budget uh, and uh, uh, talk about the funding for the remainder of the design, uh, probably another fifty dollars or $60,000 for that. Uh, and, uh, uh, but this. Uh, <coughs> Just to give an example, this project is going to be a, a roughly 300 feet shorter than our Regency Drive uh, project was, uh, but it's going to cost almost twice as much. Uh, the Regency Drive, I think, was $1.2 million uh, uh, when it was all set and finished, and, and this is going to be closer to $2 million. This facialization study you've budgeted $135,000. Originally, we were going to look at the Fred Herring Center and the in terms of how we're utilizing the space in those buildings. When we really got into it, we had, we had done an RFP that looked at design services to come in and do it. We really realized we might be better suited to have an architectural firm come in. So we went back out for our RFQs and we just got those in last week. At the end of the week, we've got four bids that we're reviewing right now and we're gonna encompass site planning as well as City Hall and uh, Fred Herring and the Annex and out at Keeley and try and get a better use of the site as well as the buildings and the use within those buildings. So um, as soon as we have those reviewed, we'll have a better idea of how quickly we'll get that project done. Fire Station 3 and 8, Chief McGrath is here. I will say that that funding between the two is really a total dollar amount. We put it all on Station 8 before we created the Station 3 project. We just haven't evened it out, but those project budgets are about the same for those fire stations. We're happy to report on both of these sites. They've started construction. Everything's on time. We haven't unearthed anything that's uh, startling thus far. On Station 3, is about two weeks or so ahead of Station 8, which is going to work out good for the subs since they're using the same for both projects. Station 3, he told me this morning that they're hoping to get a slab on the ground just right before Christmas. Uh, station 8, they finished all the piers, and they'll start pouring some beams here hopefully by the end of this week. So uh, everything's going real well on both of those sites. Are signs up yet, Terry, on the sides? Uh, I did not see them today, and uh, we have a construction meeting tomorrow, okay. and we're going to follow up with them. I know we're getting lots of questions about what is that, so right. we've got those yeah. ordered, and 
They've submitted the, we, we ran that through James, uh, they've submitted the, what it's going to look like. It hasn't been produced yet, but we'll check on that tomorrow. And so our training tower, we received some funding uh, to do a study to, to figure out what the best direction to go on our, our training tower. Currently it's about 25 years old and, and it's not usable right now. So um, we, at the direction of, of city management, we reached out to some partners to see if we could stir up some interest on anyone else that wanted to join us perhaps and, and, uh, and make a, um, a grand project down there and, and, and hopefully make it, uh, make it something that we can partner with, with some um, some uh, entities around us. So the colony, we met with them, they're uh, extremely interested in joining us on this project and we've had a couple of meetings with NCTC and they've expressed a lot of interest in, um, in partnering with us at, on, the, on the, the light end at least to uh, utilize the space on a lease agreement but hopefully we're, we're going to partner a little bit heavier with them and, and, and hopefully have a, uh, a facility down there that's going to offer both uh, medical training, the EMT and paramedic programs, and also fire training. So uh, we're pretty excited about that and both uh, we're, we're still working with both partners on, on how it's going to look. This project is what we're calling our pedestrian bridges. It's down at uh, Lake Vista, uh, south of the mall. Uh, uh, several years ago, we received some uh, escrow, developer escrow money, uh, and it's coming time for that, uh, uh, that we either need to use it or lose it. So uh, uh, we're going to move forward with this project to build uh, two pedestrian bridges across the uh, lake uh, there, uh, just, north of this, or just north of the 121 toll lake. Uh, you can see those two locations uh, showing kind of a light aqua color, uh, uh, one by the Hampton Inn and, and the uh, Hilton Garden, <coughs> and the one uh, closer down by business, you know, I have business, but it's the tollway, uh, 121 tollway. Um, in addition to that, uh, we're going to build uh, part of the trail that's uh, not out there yet. Uh, a lot of the trail is already out there, uh, but uh, we've got some pieces that haven't been completed. Uh, and uh, we think we've got enough money for what we can call a phase one project, which includes the two bridges, the pedestrian bridges, and then uh, the trail that's shown in a light pink color. Um, and then uh, hopefully we'll come along uh, in the next fiscal year uh, uh, and be able to do uh, the trail that's shown in uh, orange uh, on the map. And uh, 450000 of that 920 is what you budgeted last year, as, as well as the escrow money that David referred to from the other... The traffic <coughs> Good evening, Mayor Council. Um, what this project is encompassing is the current traffic network that we have today supports nothing but the, the traffic signals. And that equipment, um, some of it is no longer supported, uh, and some of it just doesn't quite meet the bandwidth utilizations. The 900 megahertz radios that connect are probably about 70% of that infrastructure, and we're not able to stream any video over it. Um, in this budget year, the 17-18 budget year, we have funding for an assessment, uh, really a study, and there's two major deliverables that are going to come out of that. One's going to be a, a traffic study, um, as well as a communication master plan. Now, that communication master plan, uh, what we're going to, currently we've got a PSA that's gone through legal um, with Kim Lee Horn, and so we're looking at uh, February actually presenting something to you guys as far as a workshop. But during this assessment, they're going to look at things such as uh, current city infrastructure, you know, assets that we might be able to utilize, um, as well as doing things like um, uh, frequency studies to see what type of interference, see what type of technologies that we can leverage. Um, this particular project, we estimate, it's going to run roughly about 1.4 million, and we're going to phase it over four, three to four years. Um, after this year, after we get the actual um, study completed, the second phase will concentrate on the backhaul infrastructure, which would be either your fiber and or it could be wireless, but it's going to be the backhaul, if you will. So think of it as a freeway to get all that traffic back. And then the next year, we would be looking at replacing all of the endpoints. So roughly over 100 intersections, you would be looking at having your communication equipment. <coughs> um, that equipment is, is primarily uh, going to be utilized for this traffic network. However, we want to build it to be able to leverage other opportunities. 
So if there's something out there that another department, public safety or whatnot, you know, wants to leverage and want to make sure that it's robust enough to, to take that into consideration. Um, the glass phase will actually be uh, concentrated on the traffic side of it, and that's going to be with the current um, ATMS uh, software that they run, uh, looking to see what type of uh, uh, functionality that we're using, what can we leverage. Um, furthermore, there'll be a traffic wall designed out of this to be able to uh, look at any video real time from any of these intersections. Uh, there's also another portion of this that has to do with the ELC build out. So if we're going to incorporate that into this, we'll actually have a, have a plan and that'll be part of the communication master plan as well as the, the traffic master plan. Thank you. And the last project we have tonight is computer, computer aided dispatch. <coughs> Do you want to yeah, as you approve this in the current budget uh, to try to purchase this year, uh, we uh, were able to avoid a, uh, a cost study from uh, that was budgeted from the Crime Control Prevention District because of doing it in the house. So we saved about 80 grand doing that. But we're expecting to go to uh, go out to bid mid December. Uh, probably for like 60 days, and then once we decide upon a vendor, 12 to 18 months uh, to get that installed. Should gain a lot more efficiency there with a blanks of duplicate entry, having multiple layers for all public safety partners, fire, police, EMS. Right now we all share one, and it doesn't work too well, especially when you expand it into two different stations. So should be should be a good thing for the city. They're replacing software that's over 20 years old. It's 17. It's out of this purpose. Okay. Yeah. That is uh, the few projects we have underway. Okay, we will. We got a few minutes. Uh, Brent, could you do the uh, invocation? For sure. Okay. <coughs> we'll go to out of one public hearing. We'll go through this fairly quickly. Uh, item two. Did you want to say something, Don, about the two things being related? Yeah, I mean, the first is a zoning change on the facility, and then the next item, the second public <coughs> hearing, is actually the SUP. Uh, so both of these relate to a facility uh, that sits off of Business 121 that will be basically a pet daycare, not boarding, pet daycare. Okay. So it's, this facility is currently vacant, so it's probably very, very good reuse, I think. Uh, down to consent agenda, item three. Item four. You see a March date now for uh, the new restaurant, uh, the female restaurant, day two steakhouse. Item five. This is a very complicated change. Um, and basically what it does, our employees are not in Social Security. And so back in the early 80s when that was allowable, um, we put in place a uh, Social Security replacement program and that is composed of deferred comp, life insurance, and LTD. And so what we're doing, that deferred comp portion has always been in the 457 plan. And so the way that system works, it's voluntary. But if an employee contributes at least 4% of their salary, the city contributes a matching 3.76%. All of that's been going into the 457. What this allows is the city's match to go into the 401A. It allows us to put a vesting schedule on that 401A. That will not affect existing employees, but will affect employees hired January uh, 1st and after. It benefits the city, obviously it's a savings uh, because uh, we have a higher turnover in that first five years of employment. And again, it was meant to replace Social Security. So uh, that would then stay uh, in the plan. Uh, <coughs> so it also benefits employees because right now there's a cap on what you can defer, and that's, I believe, the lender 18,000 uh, for employees. So, but that city portion limits the amount of the employee salary they can defer. So now that really allows them to do a full 18,000 of their salary into deferred comp with the city's match going into 401A. So it actually increases their ability to save. 
We right now, uh, because we are not Social Security and because we contribute, we have a much higher percentage of participation of our employees than do other organizations. And we actually, our assets right now between Valak and Nationwide are right at 70 million. So it's considerable. Uh, but we think this is a very good move. Melinda and Matt will be going out to talk with all of our employees about this starting tomorrow. Okay. Down to item six, the regular hearings. And item seven, I'm going to be abstaining on that, so if we need to talk about it, I need to leave the room. Print the church. Okay. Item seven, we'll wait till he gets out of the room. <coughs> Anything for item seven? Yeah, David Terry. What? David Terry. Ethan. So put all the votes on here. And what we don't know uh, is how LISD <coughs> will vote, and that's no. really the they're the ones that carry it. That's when they right. Get all the That's exactly right. Working. So, it'd be nice to know, but they don't vote until they send the deal So, That's gentlemen, true. you all have any comments or? I'm still yeah. favor, Dave. You know, okay. Make that motion then? I'll make it for all of them. One of them. Okay. Any other reports? Anything else? No. Okay. We're adjourned until 7 o'clock. <coughs> Seven o'clock, we'll call tonight's council meeting to order. Uh, we do have a forum present. We'll start with invocation uh, given by uh, Mayor Pro Tem Daniels, followed by the uh, pledge to the American and Texas flag by Councilman Ferguson. Please rise and join us for a moment of silent prayer and reflection. Please join us in a pledge to our flags. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you. City Secretary. First item on. Go ahead, present. Go ahead and start the presentation. First item is a presentation. It's a presentation of the James Viers Field Officer Award to Animal Control Officer Darren Dixon, and I believe Councilman Jones. I'm sorry, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem Jones will be presenting that. I'd like to call uh, Ethel Struther and uh, Darren Dixon up. So, at the, animal, at the Texas Animal Control Association's yearly meeting, individuals are nominated to receive various awards on the state level for their outstanding contribution to the animal care and control field. One of the most prestigious awards is the James Viers Field Officer Award. This award is given each year to an outstanding animal control officer in the state of Texas who has, through his or her actions, performed duties above and beyond what is normally required or has consistently performed at a professional level representing his or her agency in a professional manner at all times. This year, our animal control officer, Darren Dixon, was awarded the James Viers Field, Award, Field Officer Award. And right now, we'll allow his supervisor, Ethel, to come forward and speak to us a little bit. Thank you. Um, Officer Dixon was nominated for this award for um, assisting myself and, and him while we uh, were supporting relief efforts in Hurricane Harvey down in Port Arthur and Rockport. And um, 
He represented the city in a very professional manner. He went over and beyond the call of duty in less than perfect conditions. Uh, he never griped, he never complained. He was always eager and willing to help. He was very sympathetic to those who had lost everything, including their animals, uh, during the flooding situations. And um, it, was, it was a great honor to be able to work with him, and, and he, he totally deserves this award. Um, he also has designed a map uh, in Google Maps that outlines problematic areas in the city uh, where there's loose dogs, um, aggressive dogs, and uh, this allows the officers coming in that are new to be able to um, learn these areas without us having to go and show them. They have a map in hand that can, that can show these, uh, and he just did this totally on his own. Um, and the officers are able to go in and update the areas as, as needed. And um, we're just, just very thankful to have Darren on our staff and, and part of our team. Thank you. Darren, would you like to say a few words to the folks? Yes, sir. In both Rockport and Port Arthur, I saw the profound effect that our work Oh, thank you. I saw the profound effect that our work and presence had on the city employees. They were able to sleep again, if only for a few days. They were able to go to their homes and handle their affairs and put their lives back together. I saw professionalism and grit during that period of time that I don't recall having seen in that measure before. The measure, the disaster had broken their homes, but it did not fracture the community or the individuals in it. I'm humbled by the honor of the company we were able to keep during the disaster relief effort, and I'm still humbled by the honor of the company I keep working every day with Louisville Animal Services. Both before and after the relief effort for Hurricane Harvey, I had begun to work on a map to outline the problem areas in the city to better assist animal services with patrols. It is my hope that one day the information we gather may come to be utilized by our public safety dispatchers so as to assist with the other departments in their service to our community. It has been a tremendous honor to have been recognized by both the Texas Animal Control Association and now the city of Louisville. I hope to continue work as all in the city do to progress and maintain the values inherent in our city government and development services. Thank you. And this is the award. Consideration of an ordinance granting a zone change from multifamily one district to general business district on 0 0.55 acres located at 139 Valley View Drive. The request for a zone change to GB is compatible with the surrounding area. PNC recommended approval by a vote of 5 to 0. The recommendation is that the City Council approve the ordinance as set forth in the caption. We have a Planning Director Richard Ludke available for any questions. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Okay. We have a motion to close public hearing. Move to, well, move to close the public hearing. Second. We have a motion and second to close the public hearing. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Move to approve the ordinance as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve as presented. City Attorney. This is an ordinance of the Louisville City Council amending the zoning ordinance by rezoning an approximately 0.56 acre lot legally described as Lot 3B, Block A, Timber Valley Edition, located on the north side of Valley View Drive, approximately 470 feet west of State Highway 121 Business 
at 139 Valley View Drive from Multifamily 1 District Zoning to General Business District Zoning, correcting the official zoning map, preserving all other portions of the zoning ordinance, determining that the public interest and general welfare demand this zoning change and amendment therein made, providing for repealer severability penalty and an effective date and declaring an emergency. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Public hearing number two. Consideration of an ordinance granting a special use permit and one associated variance for a kennel with outdoor runs on 0 0.558 acres located at 139 Valley View Drive. The property owner plans to convert the existing building into a pet daycare. A variance is requested to allow a six-foot vinyl screening fence at the west property line. PNZ recommended approval by, of the SUP by a vote of five to zero. The recommendation is that the City Council approve the ordinance and variance as set forth in the caption. Planning Director Richard Ludke is available to address any questions. Okay. Anybody in Council has any questions? Okay. Is there a motion to close the public hearing? Move to close the public hearing. Second. Second. We have a motion to second to close the public hearing. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. <coughs> Move to approve as presented. Okay. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve as presented. Uh, Councilor. This is an ordinance of the Louisville City Council amending the zoning ordinance by granting a special use permit for a kennel with outdoor runs on approximately 0.56 acre lot legally described as lot 3B block A Timber Valley Timber Village edition located on the north side of Valley View Drive approximately 470 feet west of State Highway 121 business at 139 Valley View Drive and zone general business district providing for repealer severability penalty and effective date and declaring an emergency. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Visitor citizen form. At this time, any person with business before the council not scheduled on the agenda may speak to the council. No formal action can be taken on these items at this meeting. We have received no cards. Okay. Consent agenda. All of the following items on the consent agenda are considered to be self-explanatory by the council and will be enacted with one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a council member or citizen so request. For a citizen to request removal of an item, a speaker card must be filled out and submitted to the city secretary. We have received no cards. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve? Move to approve. Second. Do we have a motion to approve and a second? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Agenda item six. Consideration of approval of a request to name the disc golf course at Lake Park the Tom Oldman McCretchen Disc Golf Course. A request has been submitted to recognize the efforts of a former resident and parks advocate by naming the disc golf course at Lake Park the Tom Oldman McCretchen Disc Golf Course. The Park and Parks and Recreation Advisory Board unanimous, unanimously approved the request. The recommendation is that the City Council approve the request as set forth in the caption. We have the following individuals who have filled out cards indicating their support of this item. Judy McCretchen, Jackie Robertson, Lynn Elliott, Gary Robertson, and Linda Yu. We also have Bob Monahan who wishes to speak before the City Council. Okay. Come on up, Bob. Give us your name and address for the record, please. Bob Monahan, 140 Metal Known, Double Oak, Texas. Mayor and Council, it's it's good to see you again. Uh, interesting from from this aspect, though. Uh, I first met Tom McCutcheon in about 1994 when I was working as your park manager. He came into the park office and asked if we knew anything about disc golf and then went on to ask us if we would consider uh, putting a disc golf course in L.L. Woods Park. And so we discussed it a little bit further and um, then he and another gentleman uh, came up with a plan to fund the installation of it. So we put in nine baskets to begin with at L.L. Woods to see how it would work and 
and work through moving the the placements to avoid uh, uh, any any uh, interference with uh, other activities. It was immediately a success, um, and and in big part because of Tom's involvement. He was out there all the time. He was out there talking to individuals that knew how to play, uh, coaching those that didn't. And it wasn't long, and we installed the second nine holes out there. And then the sport continued to grow, and we were looking for another location to uh, uh, add a second disc golf course. And that went out to Lake Park in an area that had been undeveloped. Uh, it's where the old trailer park was years ago, and it had gotten to be a, a problem area. So Tom worked with us. Uh, and designed the disc golf course, um, pulled in volunteers to help us with the clearing of the fairways and, and um, disc golf wouldn't be in Louisville today if it wasn't for Tom McCutcheon and it, it wouldn't be as popular in Louisville. Tom spent endless hours out there um, because he loved the sport. He was um, classified with with uh, national rankings, um, had, had placed in national tournaments. Uh, but he just truly loved the sport, loved to introduce uh, people to it that hadn't seen it. He, he was an advocate for the sport. He was an ambassador for Louisville to the disc golf community. And it was a, a real pleasure uh, to work with him over all of those years. Uh, Tom would bring tournaments in, he'd schedule cleanup days out there with everybody, and uh, um, Tom passed away uh, a little over five years ago, and the disc golf community immediately came to me at that time um, as, as the department director uh, wanting to name the park after Tom, um, but of course we have the five-year waiting period after a death. Um, so uh, we're beyond that five year period of time. And so uh, the request has been submitted. Um, there's still a large following in disc golf. Um, again, because of Tom's involvement, um, you go out there and ask anybody if they hadn't <coughs> met Tom Old Man McCutcheon, they certainly know who he is. I think any time uh, you have an opportunity to name a park after somebody in the community, it certainly adds uh, character to the park and helps preserve the local history. And this is one way that I, I think you could certainly do it. So um, we thank you for your consideration. Okay. Uh, do you have anybody you'd like to inter introduce to us from the family? Uh, Mrs. Judy McCutcheon. Thanks for being here. And, and you, I'm sorry, I don't remember. Robertson, his sister. Tom's sister. And okay. the other folks with us are his very close friends that support the sport. And Mike Strong is a, his, with his partner in business <coughs> and still owns a business. Okay. Thank you. I, I want everybody to know, too, that the council and, and I had nothing to do with the name of Old Man being on this. <laughs> that, that is not ours. Because you mentored a lot of young people and families and um, you want to the microphone and so everybody can hear you? <laughs> yeah. We've got, the, we've got a huge broadcast audience here. So. <laughs> Old Man was his nickname because... He mentored a lot of the younger guys that came out there in many ways other than just disc golf. And he just promoted the, the sport and just loved people and wanted to help them in any way he could. And so it just it's a, a very fond. Most people, when you get to call them old, you know, you're not happy about it. But for him, it was a very special treasured nickname. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Do you have any comments or a motion? Somebody? I'll make the motion okay. to uh, rename this park uh, as presented. 
Second. second. We have a motion to second. Is there any discussion? Just to clarify, it's that to name the disc golf Do, course. It's what? To disc rename golf. the disc. It's the golf. disc golf course. Sorry. Yes, you're right. Okay. The whole park. We we straight now. Okay. Yes. My second right. is for that. Okay. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. Okay, motion carries. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you. And uh, the next item I'll be abstaining on because I'm employed by the Denton Central Appraisal District. <coughs> Turn it over to Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Okay, item number seven. Consideration of a resolution casting Louisville votes for directors to the Denton Central Appraisal District Board. The Denton Central Appraisal District has furnished a list of nominated candidates for election to their board of directors. The city of Louisville has been allocated 109 votes. The five nominees receiving the most votes become the board. The recommendation is that the City Council cast votes for directors to the Denton Central Appraisal District <coughs> Board, and we have David Terry here to speak before the City Council. Mr. Terry? And if you'll please state your name and address for the record. You know, I'm accustomed to being over on that side, asking that, making that request to be on this side. Uh, I am David Terry. I live in a colony, Texas, at 3941 Teal Cove. And I, I want to I wanna wish all of you a um, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, and a healthy new year. Uh, I, am, I am a council member, and it was exciting. One week ago uh, tonight, I was took the oath of office for my third term. You know, like Louisville, we have a lot of really good things going on in the county, and I'm excited to be a part of that development and uh, start my third term. I also want to, uh, want to let you know that we have 42 cities that make up the uh, Denton Central Appraisal District, and of those 42 cities, I'm the only council person representing those cities on the board. And I am seeking a third term. I do think it's beneficial to have a representative who is on a council, uh, is very familiar with you know, what the council does and how to integrate that with the appraisal district. Uh, two years ago, I came here and, and um, I asked for your support and you voted your 120 votes towards my reelection uh, and that was my second term. Um, you know, you always measure people by their performance, and I am pleased to tell you that over the two-year period, always to me, number one is you, you need to be there. And I have worked my schedule to make sure I've attended every meeting, um, and so I'm there. Um, I like serving on the board, and I believe I've made significant contributions to the success. And we do have a great, great appraisal district. Um, Anybody can check it out and, you know, find out how we compare it. it it's it's a, at the top of the charts. Um, I am asking for your support again for my third term, and uh, and you do have 109 votes that you're accountable for to cast, and uh, that would be vitally beneficial to me uh, to be reelected. And I uh, I would ask for that support and thank you for your support on the previous election. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Ferguson. Thank you. Um, so, um, Councilman Terry, first of all, thank you for your service and um, your uh, commitment and your uh, uh, attendance record is, I think, a, very much a statement of your uh, desire to do a great job. For that reason, I'm uh, going to uh, move that the Louisville City Council uh, cast all 109 of its allocated votes to uh, approve your appointment, a reappointment 
to the appraisal district. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Councilman Ferguson, a second by Councilman Troyer. Any discussion? No? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you very much. Congratulations. Appreciate your support. <clears throat> the mayor gets to take over back now. Okay. <clears throat> We're down to reports. Yes, Mayor, I'd just like to remind everybody that starting tomorrow night, December 5th, Santa Claus will be back in the city of Louisville and will be making his rounds to all the neighborhoods, mobile home parks, apartment complexes, will be accompanied by our fireman on the fire truck. And he will do this every night from 6 to 8 p.m. until he has covered the entire city. So for those that want to track his progress and know when he's close to your neighborhood, uh, you can go on the city's website and there will be a link to uh, called Santa Tracker and you'll be able to click on that link and be able to see where he's at every night between the hours of 6 and 8 and know when he's close to your home. Okay, thank you. Hey, Sam? No? Russ? Yes, Mayor. Uh, last of our Coffee with Cops events is this Wednesday, uh, December 6th from 4.30 to 6.30 at Martinez Grill here in Old Town. So we look forward to everybody coming out and having some coffee with us and enjoy some conversation. Okay, thank you. James, do you have something? Yes, thank you, Mayor. I just want to give a couple of a uh, little bit of some information from the second half of our holiday stroll that was held on Saturday. As Council will recall, the larger portion was held on the 18th of November. We had a very good turnout for that event. This past Saturday, we had the pancake breakfast, the parade, and the motorcycle toy run. The Rotary Club sold more than a thousand tickets for the pancake breakfast, the best number we've heard from them. So, an outstanding morning. They were very busy. The uh, Santa button line was steady throughout the day. The toy run drew about 350 motorcycles, which with as many runs as there are out there now, 350 is, is a strong number. We're very pleased with that. The parade, we had about 48 entries. That's down from about 60 the last time we had a parade. But remember the past two years, the parade was a victim of the weather, rain and ice. So we haven't had a Christmas parade in three years. We might have to start building some of that back up. So overall, we felt like it was a successful event. We were very pleased to have all of council participate in the parade, and we're already looking at ways to tweak it for next time. I'll share one more item. We did on-site surveys of attendees on the 18th, and we just got the survey results back today. And one question we asked was, we split this out to two days. Do you want it to be two days? Do you want it to be one day, or do you care? And we had 30% uh, that said they want it to be one day, 31% said they don't care, and 38% said they like the two days. So it's not overwhelming. It's pretty evenly split, but there is at least some support out there. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Mayor of the Lake is two feet below the conservation pool level. Uh-oh, got the drought mm -hmm. coming on us. Yeah. Do a rain dance. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Nothing, Eric? Okay. I did see Eric at the parade. He was holding up the fence. It was a very good job. Thank you. I also saw Eric at the parade. <laughs> you know, and I just have to say once again, kudos to the staff uh, for the parade. One of the things that amazes me the most, if, if y'all have ever watched this, and I'm always amazed by some of this, you know, behind the scenes stuff. If you'll watch the parade and after it's done and then you watch those barriers come down, Oh my gosh, those guys get it down so fast. It's it's amazing, especially when you see like Western Days and some of those. Those guys get a workout. They do a great job, and uh, the entire city staff did a great job on that. So just wanted to commend them and everybody that was involved with that. So thank you very much. Uh, and last but not least, and I, I wish I was saying this on the other side of it, um, for those of you who get involved with Louisville High School, what a fantastic performance they just had recently of The Little Mermaid. And uh, if you ever get a chance to go to some of their performances, this one was outstanding. I saw uh, James Kunky there selling uh, refreshments at uh, intermission and crowns and everything else, but it was just a fantastic performance. I was really impressed by the quality and the, uh, just the technical aspects that they did. So good job by them. And that's it. Okay. Deputy Mayor uh, Pro Tem. Yes, I just want to commend the staff as well. I saw our own city manager out there on candy cleanup patrol uh, while we're throwing candy at people. I didn't see our assistant city manager out there throwing something at him, too, to give him something more to, to dodge. <laughs> I'm, I made up for it, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
while I'm here, I just want to wish my mom, who is one a part of our huge broadcast audience, she lives in Louisville, a happy birthday. Uh, she she watches and she lets me know how well I'm doing or not doing. Um, <laughs> back to city business. Uh, on December 9th, uh, Santa Paul's Village at the Louisville Animal Shelter. Uh, it'll be from 10 o'clock to 2 p.m. at the Gene Carey uh, Animal Shelter and Adoption Center. They're looking to clear out some more pets uh, that you can have for your home for Christmas and the holidays. Okay. No comments on the... On the parade, and uh, I swept up a lot of candy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, somebody needed to get it out of the pickup I was in because that's where most of it oh, was. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to start off with the MCL Grand, and then I've got one other thing. Uh, MCL Grand, we have the following live performances Snow presented by Impulse at Dance Project. Uh, they're doing two shows on December 9th and 10th. Uh, Louisville Civic Chorale will be performing on December 16th, a uh, concert titled Christmas with the Louisville Civic Chorale. Also December 16th, the Nutty Nutcracker, which is very funny, uh, presented by Lake City's Ballet Theater. And then December 22nd, and uh, I think a very interesting concert, Texas Smooth Groove Holiday Concert featuring Tom Braxton, Mark, Har Mark Harper, Fingerprints, and Tony Red. Uh, and then we have public events, so we've got a LuLaRoe shopping event on December 17th, uh, Yoga in the Plaza, it says it continues through November, are they still doing, because the weather's nice, you know, they should have kept going, um, but I guess they stopped. <laughs> um, acoustic Jam, always good, I'm always trying to get more people to go see that. And then a couple of art gallery things in the northern hallway, uh, Holiday Magic runs through December 30th. And then the main gallery is something that we're trying new this year that uh, personally interested me and my wife, but I think uh, everybody ought to go check it out. It's called A Gift of Art, uh, where we've invited uh, local artists to bring uh, their works of art up to five per artist maximum. And um, uh, those, the, the uh, decision on what would be in the show made by the MCL Grand staff, and so that display is now up. And the items, I think, although an artist can reserve an item and not have it for sale, almost all, if not all, of the items are for sale and have a price on it. And so it's a chance to see what, um, you know, the artistic scope is of our community and uh, well worth going to check out. Uh, changing subjects, uh, something else I want to be personally thankful for. I uh, decided to test the uh, weight-bearing capacity of my left foot and uh, it turns out that it actually uh, managed pretty well, but nevertheless, uh, it took um, a very uh, healthy um, uh, off patrol officer, Neil Merchant, to get that 1,000-plus uh, pound motorcycle lifted off my foot, and then uh, the EMS company to uh, get under each one of my shoulders and pull me out faster than I could say pull me out of a giant pile of debris and uh, so I want to personally thank uh, Neil Merchant, uh, Avery Spragans, uh, Kyle Allen, Gary Anderley, and then from the medics, uh, Brandon Cook, uh, Jeremiah Wiley, and Hunter Willard for a, it's fun, it's not fun, it's interesting, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's almost kind of rewarding to be on the other side of seeing how all of this goes down when you're the emergency and see how our team performs, and they, um, um, I just can't say enough good. Um, they, they really, everybody, everybody did a great job, and, and they probably knew who I, was, who I was, but I think they probably do the same thing for anybody else. But uh, please tell them thank you from me, because um, they took a tough situation and certainly made it a lot easier to, to deal with, so thank you both. I will add my uh, compliment, or compliments to the, everyone involved in putting on the holiday stroll. Um, I wasn't aware of how many tickets we sold for the pancake breakfast. All I know is that I was, t I was selling tickets, and I was busy continuously from the time we started until I left. So, uh, But again, con com my compliments to everyone who was involved in putting on the, the day's uh, activities. That's okay. all. Counselor? And I'll second that. Mr. Secretary. Officer, thanks for your uh, contributions to the community. Thank you. And sure you don't want to talk? 
Okay. Unless you want me to. No. We don't want to force you. Closed session. In accordance with Texas Government Code Subchapter D, Section 551.072, Real Estate Property Acquisition, Section 551.087, Economic Development, Deliberation Regarding Economic Development Negotiations. Okay. We'll now go into closed session. We'll call the council back, session back to order. Uh, is there any action to be taken? Move to adjourn. Second. We have a motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. We are adjourned. Ever seen this? Thank you.